I'm the sort of person that always sets goals and it's really important for me to have a challenge so that I can push myself to actually achieve it. My trip takes me through 28 different African countries and covers 40,000 miles and actually is a fifth of the world's surface area. Spencer, when he decides to do something, he is a determined character and he's a strong character. But I must say that this came as a bit of a surprise, quite frankly. 28,000 miles around Africa on his own, without any support, is quite a task. It's a challenge. The sacrifice I've had to make, obviously, is I've got to give up my family for a year. Um, I have two girls, and uh, it's going to be difficult for them, and it's going to be difficult for me, but I hope they'll be proud when I return. Well, obviously, I'm really proud of him, and I really hope he can do this, but I'm slightly worried, especially about countries that are dangerous. Of course it's reckless. <laughs> Spencer does have a habit of living on the edge. Obviously, we're all going to miss him, but we know that he can do this and he will come back safely. I admire and respect people who try these extreme challenges. I think the appeal about motorcycling is that it is a very free-spirited adventure, in the sense that you are alone with the machine, you need to feel the machine, and at the same time you're getting overload on your senses because you're seeing new landscapes, new people, and you have to stay very, very alert all the time. Finally, after a year of planning, the day has arrived for Spencer to pack his bag and set off on his epic journey. The British weather turns up in all its splendor, as does the entire village, family and friends, to wish Spencer the luck he will need. Bikers who've heard about this ambitious journey also turn up to ride with him to Dover, where he'll board the ferry to France. With this send-off, he can't change his mind and run off to the nearest cosy pub. Spencer's plan is to ditch his soaking wet biker mates and cross the English Channel at Folkestone to Calais. From there, he'll travel 1,000 kilometres through France to Marseille. At Marseille, he'll leave the land of garlic and casseroles to catch the overnight ferry to the land of hummus and kebabs, Tunisia, which will be the start of his African adventure. It's really weird. I'm doing this because I have to, but I don't feel in the mood because I've just driven through France in the pouring rain. Respect to everybody who helped me out, and I'm going to make it. It's day one of 365 days if I get back. Spencer's ambition for this epic adventure is not only to complete his journey within one year, but to achieve this on less than 20 euros a day. This will need to cover all fuel, food, accommodation, visas, bribes and any other costs. He'll also be recording the whole trip on a diary cam, which he's never used before. Diary cams are going to get better, it's just a matter of practice really. Um, smells in here. Safely on board the ferry at Marseille, Spencer steams away from the garlic breath of France to make the 22-hour crossing to Port Tunis in Tunisia. Formerly a French colony, Tunisia borders Algeria and Libya. Immediately upon arrival, Spencer gets straight on his bike and heads south for 300 kilometers towards the Libyan border. Right, I'm in a place called Sfax in the east coast of um, Tunisia, about halfway down the country. And what I've got to do tomorrow is I've got to get out of this crazy city. And what I've decided to do is stick the helmet camera on. Even though there's police on every corner, they're probably going to stop me, but it's worth a try. Just want you to get some sort of idea of how hectic it is. Suffering from stress face and what's known as white line fever, Spencer races across Tunisia through Gabez and Medanin, clocking up 350 kilometers in one day, 
to reach the Libyan border at Ras Algier. Travelling in Libya is heavily restricted. The only way Spencer can be permitted to cross this vast country is to be escorted. The moment he crosses the border, he's met by two chain-smoking Libyans in need of dental care and their car. Spencer's only option is to follow their Deo Leganza for the next three days in order to cross Libya and reach the Egyptian border. Good morning, it's day seven. Excellent day. Yesterday got picked up at the border. Um, Libyan-Tunisian border by two guys, Mohammed and Sam. A bit chaotic, but we got through. Driver, Mohammed, he just jumped in the car, so it's typical African style. He said, follow me. 120, 130, 140 kilometers an hour through traffic. He nearly crashed about six times. So today I'm just not gonna let him push it. I'm uh, gonna take it easy. At a slower pace, Spencer makes good progress along the coast road through Tripoli. At Al Coombs, he visits the Roman ruin Leptis Magna, then continues on to Benghazi and Tobruk. Finally, after three days and 1,500 kilometers, he parts company with his new mates when he reaches the Egyptian border at El Saloum. Egypt borders Libya, Sudan, Israel and the Gaza Strip. It has a surprisingly large population of 84 million, who mainly live along the Nile, because the rest of the place is desert. After only 10 days on the road, Spencer has crossed four borders, averaging one country every two and a half days. Although clearly still in the grip of white line fever, he's beginning to settle into his journey. Yeah, when you're reading the books about long distance traveling and adventure riding and all that business, you read things and you think, yeah, right, but you know, it all falls into place after a while. You've got to set up routine. On my left hand inside pocket are my spare keys. On my right inside pocket is my mobile phone. At the bottom of my right trouser leg is my passport. On the bottom of my left trouser leg is my money. It organises your brain and, and you've got less worries, especially when you're going through a hectic border. Egyptian border, you know, 500 people pushing you around, hands everywhere, no personal space here at all, absolutely none. OK, I'm in a place called Marsha Matrush and it's really beautiful. I just wanted to tell you about uh, the best meal I've had so far on this trip. There were these five guys in the desert and they were cooking up a meal and they called me over. It was absolutely brilliant. We had um, seasoned meat, uh, we had unleavened bread, we had a salad with sort of diced carrots, um, tomatoes and whole chilies and they were really great. They also had a hawk. Anyway, they weren't too keen on me filming them, but I managed to persuade them after a while, uh, after they'd hidden their guns for some reason. I don't know, I thought you allowed guns here. After showing his gratitude for a meal served by five guys with loaded guns, Spencer travels the 450 kilometers to Cairo to get a visa for Sudan. Deciding to stay one night, he finds some low-budget accommodation downtown. OK, this is the hotel I'm staying at in the middle of Cairo. That's the roof you can see in perfect condition. It cost me about three pounds to stay here. Here's reception. Feel at home away from home. I certainly don't. See, they have, they have made an effort. Look, this place is hilarious. The restaurant. And here it is. There we go. Class. After getting the Sudanese visa sorted and experiencing the luxury accommodation of Cairo, Spencer skips the pyramid tour and heads south along the fertile banks of the famous River Nile. His next destination is Luxor. Um, I've noticed, because this is a bit off the beaten track, so I've come into some little towns, there's been four or five junctions, and you have to drive around. You ask someone, same old story, he says one way. You ask someone else and he says, no, it's the other way. So you find out from about five people, and if three of them agree, you go for it. I've arrived in Luxor, and I'm standing on the banks of the River Nile. How brilliant is that? And maybe in the distance, in a minute, you'll be able to see the iconic Valley of the Kings. Staying in the Bob Marley Hostel, 
which has got all the cliches. It's got Che Guevara posters, Bob Marley posters, Kurt Cobain posters, that kind of thing. It's kind of like my bedroom when I was 18. It's nice after Cairo to be in this relaxed place. I'm waiting for Diesel film crew to come and we'll, we'll see you know, um, what happens with the filming. We're filming all the way down to Aswan. And then my next step is Aswan to Wadi Halfa, 22 hour ferry, and then I'm in Sudan. Brilliant. Before Spencer left England, he received free laser eye treatment. In return, the laser company requested an advert to be shot during his journey. After spending a lot of time trying to find a suitable location, the camera crew finally started filming at a Nubian village on the banks of the Nile. To complete the picture, they borrow a camel from a friendly local. Spencer is not a TV presenter, nor does he have any ambitions as an actor. But with numerous takes, he manages to spit out the script. However, there were a few outtakes. Laser. Laser, sir. Laser. I really didn't feel it. I, I didn't feel... Yeah, it's getting better. That was more natural, wasn't it? Don't let poor vision hold you back. That was better. That was more... As far, as far as... It's allowed me to dream up these adventures. And now, here I am, taking on the biggest challenge of my life. That's it. With an Oscar-winning performance from Spencer and some action riding shots filmed in the desert, the commercial for laser eye treatment is completed. As Diesel Films heads back to Blighty, Spencer moves on to the Aswan Dam to catch a ferry across Lake Nasa to Sudan. It's day 36 and uh, basically I'm waiting at the port, uh, Aswan port, and these are the guys that I've met along the way. It's the first bikers I've come across, actually. After a long wait, Spencer and his fellow bikers board the ferry and find space on deck to sleep for the overnight voyage to Wadi Halfa. Okay, good morning. I've got to speak pretty quietly, so I hope you can hear me above the engine. Um, if you want to get down into sub-Saharan Africa, you have to catch this ferry. And as it stands now, we got on the ferry at 9 o'clock yesterday morning, and it didn't go till 10 o'clock at night. It was absolutely freezing, and the worst thing is I'm sleeping right by the very edge of the boat. This is how I slept, I'll show you. Looking like a bank robber, Spencer enters Sudan at the Lake Nasser port of Wadi Halfa. The area of Darfur in western Sudan is known globally for its terrible famine and civil war. It's estimated 2.8 million people have been displaced and 300,000 killed during the crisis. Right, it's the ninth today, so it's the 40th day of my trip. So down below me is uh, the hotel where we stayed. It's down over there. Now, the thing about that hotel is it's not a hotel at all. It's kind of like a, it's like a backpacker's, but a little bit less. It's got sand floor and that sort of business. It's still arid around here. People have already changed here. They're fully Sudanese. They're much blacker, much taller. We've seen people taller than me, which is surprising compared to Egypt. Uh, but so far, everything's great. It's all going well, quite sunburnt, but that's to be expected. I'm in the desert. It's very, very hot. I know I keep saying that, but around my feet on the bike, it's really hot. Got this cool breeze when you're going but quite fast, which is about 70, maximum 80. Spencer's route through Sudan from Wadi Halfa follows the Nile to Dongola, and then the capital, Khartoum. From there, he travels along the Blue Nile to Wad Madani. Here he finds more luxury accommodation, which includes an ensuite bathroom and a laundry room for his three socks. Right, I'm fighting against time because of the light, but I've just arrived at my destination and I just wanted to tell you about my day, which was absolutely brilliant. Now, 
Um, I've ended up in a place called Wide Madani, which is about three, four hours away from the Ethiopian opium border. I should actually be at the border, but I've had four flats. Now, why did I have a wonderful day? Well, the tyre was going down, came past this place and saw tyres and everything. I thought, oh, God, I'll go in there and he can sort it out. Went in there, it was a really great guy. We basically worked together and fixed it. It was a big cut, um, a rip, in, and he sewed it up like uh, you sew up things. And then he put a double patch on it and it's absolutely perfect. So that was great. People great, riding great. OK, I left um, Wad Madani in um, Sudan this morning about half past five and I've been driving for two hours. I can't be that far from the Ethiopian border and at last the sort of landscape's beginning to change a little bit. It, getting out of the desert sort of at last after four countries of it. Before Spencer leaves Sudan, he visits the typical roadside fast food outlet and orders himself a fresh local delicacy. There we are, this is our food. We're gonna eat it. Yes. Ethiopia has a population of 93 million, making it the most populated landlocked country in the world. Right, I've been in Ethiopia for about an hour and I'm absolutely blown away by the place. It is beautiful. The change from Sudan is just incredible. I'm not saying Sudan isn't beautiful, but everything's changed. The people have changed, the clothing's changed. They look a lot poorer. Uh, but a lot happier, they're a lot more friendly so far. The scenery is absolutely stunning. The riding is completely different now. I've gone down to 40 kilometers an hour because you've got no idea what's around each corner, but it's great. Spencer's route through Ethiopia will take him to the 17th century city of Gondo. He will then head to the capital, Addis Ababa, from there, he'll journey south for 800 kilometers to the Kenyan border at Moyale. Right, I'm in the middle of a gondor, and I'm in this gondor castle. It's just unbelievable. This is such a beautiful town, absolutely beautiful. This place is weird because, well, 300 years ago, it was the second biggest um, capital in the whole of Africa uh, for about 200 years. So it's quite a historic place. No way up. At the old no ruins of Gondar, Spencer meets up with another blast from the past, his hairy mate Carl, who he first met at the ferry port of Wadi Halfa in Sudan. It's nice there. Spencer and Carl decide to camp in the city, giving them a perfect excuse to pass on their Boy Scout tips. A uh, couple of things about camping. You don't need a big tent. You can actually make it from the north to the south of Africa almost without a tent, because there's always places to stay. My opinion is take a tent, but don't take a tent like these German guys that are with me, but it's just typical. Have a look. You can fit 20 Germans in there and maybe 60 Ethiopians. That's more the kind of thing that you want. See the size difference? After a night in Gonda, Spencer continues his journey towards Kenya. As he nears the border, he hears more and more reports about lawless bandits operating in northern Kenya. The area is becoming notorious for attacks and shootings on tourists. Carl has managed to hitch a ride on a 4x4. Handy with a camera, he films Spencer as they journey towards the border. I'm getting a little bit nervous now. I'm just about 45 minutes from the border, Moyale border and uh, there's been some trouble there. Basically what happened was four people got hijacked by Samburu tribesmen, everything got stolen, and then they were stripped naked and shot. I think I'm stalling slightly because I'm a bit nervous about getting over there, so just sort of holding off a bit. OK, I don't really know what to say. It's New Year tomorrow. We're in Moyale on the border with Kenya. Um, Behind me is the convoy that's going. The reason they've got this convoy is because people are getting shot. Pretty scared at the moment. Uh, I'm going on my own. Carl's managed to get a lift with three English guys in a Land Cruiser, so I'm going to stick close with them. I uh, didn't really want to make this kind of report, but uh, we've been told by a couple of people, so that's that. Let's hope I make another report. Spencer makes it safely over the border and continues travelling alongside Carl and his 4x4 buddies. 
His plan for the next few days is to travel the 1,300-kilometer route from the border crossing at Moyale to Marsabit, and then on to Isiolo, and finally to Kenya's capital, Nairobi. But progress is slowed as he keeps sitting down for a break. Say it out again. Well, the back tire is a road tire, and it's completely bald. So in this mud here, it just won't hold the road. I got my boot wedged in here. I nearly broke my foot there. Check it out. I just got out. Look at that. I just dived out the way, but it caught my foot. Right, uh, just came down from Mayale. It's uh, 250 kilometers, and we're down in Marsa bit. Uh, had a little bit of a prank. Injured my ribs, injured my shoulder, but it's nothing serious. And a little scratch on my back, which I'll show you now, because I'm sure the audience want to see my So it's time for a shower, time for some food, and recharge the batteries for tomorrow. Back on the road, Spencer's rear wheel is taking a battering, causing a series of punctures. Because Spencer has to constantly stop for repairs, he becomes separated from the convoy and's left to fend for himself. OK, I'm facing one of the biggest problems I've faced so far. Um, I've had five punctures. It's about 40 degrees. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this is the state of my bike. Got a guy to help me. They're going to go and look for glue. And this is the road I'm going down to Isiolo. With glue found by the locals, the puncture is repaired. But Spencer is about to face a much greater and potentially fatal incident, literally around the corner. Just tell you what happened yesterday, because it's a bit weird and a bit frightening. Um, half past seven o'clock in the morning, I was driving along, and then on the top of the hill, I saw three guys. And immediately, one of them pulled up a gun and shot at me. And then there was a second shot, so I went down on the bike and I carried on riding. But then I think the third bullet must have hit the brake and the wheel, because everything just went. And uh, the wheel, you can see it's in a bad state. But I picked up the bike, they came running down the hill, and uh, I rode off. But then the problem was the wheel was uh, punctured. I didn't have any repair kit. So I carried on driving, and unfortunately, all the spokes got broken. Yeah, pretty much the most hectic day I've had on this trip so far. That's about all I can say at the moment, because my head's not really very together. The bike is unrideable, and Spencer is in a state of shock. Fortunately, he manages to make contact with Carl, who was waiting for him 100 kilometers away in Isiolo. Somehow, Carl manages to organize a truck to rescue Spencer and his busted bike. They head to the relative safety of Nairobi, where Spencer will have the time to consider the near-fatal shooting and whether he still has the will to continue. Spencer Conway's epic solo journey around Africa on a motorcycle has come to an abrupt halt due to a near-fatal shooting in northern Kenya. Fortunately, Spencer's been rescued by his friend Carl, who's organized transport to take him and the broken bike to Kenya's capital, Nairobi. He's now staying at Karen Camp on the outskirts of the city, trying to get over the ordeal. Here, he's joined by Sean, a cameraman who's flown out from the UK on Spencer's family's request to check Spencer's in one piece and able to continue with his journey. Coping with the shooting was really strange because the initial thing was so quick. I literally waved to this guy, he turned around and fired, and the bike came out from underneath me. I jumped back on the bike and rode off. It, it didn't sink in. It takes time, and the, the worst part was really the next six hours. And after about three hours, I, I really kind of, I have to admit it, I sort of broke down a little bit. Without exaggerating, I was that far from getting my legs shot off, so literally that far from being killed. It, no, it, was, it was extremely close. At no point did I ever think of stopping the trip, because I've decided to do it and I am going to do it. I would have had to be killed, <laughs> to be honest, to stop the trip.
With the decision made to continue his trip, Spencer's bike has been repaired by Rick, a local mechanic. Rick's workshop reveals an extraordinary collection of beautifully restored old cars, which on occasion are hired out to film companies. But Rick's passion is definitely bikes. This is where the Japanese copied and made the Land Cruiser. My fascination with motorbikes started a long time ago. Um, when my dad used to sort of repair motorbikes and look after motorbikes for the priests up country, he'd go to work, I'd jump on a motorbike, play with it, fall down, run it into a wall or a tin house. In the end, I had to learn how to fix it. it as if he did come home and saw that the bike was damaged or anything, i had been real problems. So that's where I got my practice. And ever since, I've always been tinkering with motorbikes. Cars I restore, I help the owner, John Rowe. He owns the place. This is a 1926 International SS motor truck. This, in its days, was the ultimate. I mean, if you went on safari or you wanted to cross anywhere, this would be the car. This was the actual car we used in the film Out of Africa. And this is the car Robert Redford drove. John's been collecting these cars throughout, I mean, from a very young age. We collect them all over the place. I mean, up country, someone calls us, says, oh, there's a car in a shed and it's rotting there. We'll literally jump in the car. We won't even think about it. This is the 1934 Rolls-Royce boat tail. It was brought in by the settlers. It was typical of the settlers in the olden days to bring in these sort of prestigious cars and use them. This was sort of cut up, made a flatbed and used for transporting milk. It literally turned out to be an expensive milk float. All the cars we have here have been locally found, locally brought in the country. This collection is a good sample of, of all the cars from the 30s, 40s. Yeah, this is a 1937 Dodge, and this was used by the British sort of police. But this car for its time was quite good. I mean, in the 30s, this had hydraulic brakes, straight six cylinder. Like the old cars, you brought an old car, you brought in the bike as well. Um, during the war, when the Allies came in, the Americans brought in Harleys, um, Indians. The Germans in Tanzania brought in all their BMWs, or just restored one, an old R11. War sort of settled, bikes were left and dumped in farms and everything. And now they're being found slowly, but not many. Rick obviously likes his old bikes, but what does he think of Spencer's modern bike? One thing for sure, it's not bulletproof. I like the Yamaha Tenere, it's very nice. Like I say, a lot of technology, very nice. Only slight disadvantage for us in Africa would be the fuel injection. I think he, when he got shot at or something, it must have, bullet must have gone through. It broke the main caliper plate completely, so we had to take that out, weld it, thread it, and fit it. The rim completely buckled. The back bracket that holds the boxes was gone completely, so we sort of shadowed roughly. We made our own out of metal. We copied from right to left. When he rode it with a flat tire and everything, I mean, there was no tire. It must have strained, quite a bit of strain on one gear. So we took that out, repaired the gear, filed it, put it together, and because otherwise we couldn't get parts for that. So we're happy with it. It worked well. With the bike repaired, it's time for Spencer to move on. But first, he wants to see for himself one of the largest slums in Africa. It's called Kibera. It's estimated that 60% of Nairobi's population live in slums. That's two and a half million people, and one million of those live here. Spencer meets up with Alvin, a resident of Kibera, who explains what life is like in the slum, how people survive, and its future. Though it's a, a slum area, many are not capable of getting their daily livelihood, providing for their siblings and so forth. Most of the people, and in fact in, in Kibera, do live in a hand-to-mouth situation whereby they only depend on the money they get on that day. The situation in Kibera is rough. Most of the people I, I, I engage with are footballers. And these footballers are many in the village because many are jobless. So they turn out to play football. As they say, an empty mind is a devil workshop we try to break that boredom so as to be something to keep us busy. The government has lagged behind. More and more uh, ghettos are being built every day instead of building new houses for the people. There is corruption and uh, lack of uh, commitment, failure to look for the poor and just concentrating on the rich. 
I can't say it's, uh, the future of Kibera is good. We just have to push life, you know. Humbled by the residents of Kibera, Spencer realizes how lucky he is. And the next morning, he loads his bike and resumes his journey, heading out of Kenya and into Tanzania. Sean, staying on to do some more filming, joins up with seasoned African traveler Jim Wales, an Australian. With Spencer on the bike and Sean in Jim's 4x4, the three of them set off for Arusha near Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. The route from Nairobi to Arusha is straightforward and a good road. It's about 270 kilometers and is easily done in a day. The border crossing offers Spencer distance from the shooting incident, but it's also a great opportunity to acquire some much needed bling. Tanzania is about four times bigger than the United Kingdom and has a population of around 44 million. It's day 84 on my trip and I've been delayed for two weeks, obviously because of my accident and fixing the bike. But I left Nairobi this morning at about seven o'clock in the morning. It's all been really good riding. I've just come through into Tanzania across the border in that direction with, um, excuse me a minute, there's a truck coming tends to happen when you do this. Um, Obonia Sambu, it's called. It's a mountain up there. And uh, it's been a bit of dirt, a um, bit of uh, tar road, but really good, and it's so nice to be back on the bike. My destination for today is Arusha. Um, it's right down that road, and right in front of us is Mount Meru. But much more exciting than that is on my left, as I was riding down, I managed to make out the snow-capped peaks of Kilimanjaro. Not only is it an iconic landmark, but it's it's iconic to me, really, in that stage of my trip, so absolutely brilliant. This route from Kenya to Tanzania is well used by safari tourists traveling between the two countries. Arusha City is the gateway to the national parks in Tanzania, namely the Serengeti, the Ungurugura Crater, and Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. After a long day's ride, and with the light fading, they finally arrive in Arusha and find a campsite. This is a place called Maasai Camp, which is pretty good, pretty organized, kind of standard. They have rooms that you can rent probably between $12, $15, but I've opted to go for the camping at $5. One little comment about arriving in places, I've got no real specific itinerary. I don't look things up in Lonely Planet, that sort of thing. So when you do come into a town, it's really a case of just asking people. What I do is I say, do you know where the local campsite is? I pop off there if it's really, really rough and I tend to ask if there's anywhere else nearby. So it's just sort of asking around. So generally you do find the right place. While Spencer, Sean and Jim are in Arusha, they decide not to miss the opportunity of visiting the spectacular Angura Gura Crater. This will be a two-day trip with an overnight at one of the permitted campsites on the crater's rim. It turns out that Jim used to be a safari guide, so he's confident he can sweet-talk his way past the restrictions and gain access for a private tour. Leaving the bike in Arusha, they set off in Jim's sturdy and reliable land cruiser. We haven't actually gone in, we're on the rim. You can't really see it behind us, but we're sitting on a campsite on the rim of the crater. We skirted it earlier, came across elephants, came across giraffe, zebra. Excellent, really, really fantastic day. Uh, this is basically the setup for camping. So get the fire going, 
get the tent in place, as you can see, get everything sorted for the next day. Tomorrow morning we're heading into the crater hoping to see lions, um, hopefully some rhino and possibly some hippos. So the real proper African experience. The next morning, they're up at sunrise. Jim manages to charm his way past the security, and they make the steep descent into the crater. As the morning mist lifts, it reveals an extraordinary variety of wildlife living in this unique place. Left camp this morning at about half past six, and we've headed down the rim of the Ngorogoro crater, and now we're in the basin of the crater. Now, the thing about this area is that it all around the edge is a massive crater, and it's a, basically the animals that are in here have been breeding through generations because they can't get out of the crater. So they're born here, they live here, and they die here, and it's incredibly beautiful. It's a completely different ecosystem. We've seen Thompson gazelles, we've seen a hyena, We've seen foxes, we've seen ostriches, and uh, that's about all I can remember at the moment because it's kind of over overwhelming. The crater is believed to have been formed two to three million years ago when a large volcano exploded and collapsed in on itself. The floor of the crater is about 160 square kilometers. Based on fossil evidence, man occupied the crater 2,000 years ago, and the first Europeans visited the crater in 1892. Two German brothers leased the land from the German East Africa administration and farmed there until the First World War broke out. The area is regarded as one of the seven natural wonders of Africa and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Maasai and other tribes are still permitted to live in the area, but are restricted to subsistence farming levels. Their visit to this spectacular crater is over, and they head back to Arusha. In true Aussie style, Jim announces he's getting married, tomorrow in Nairobi. So that night, he sets off for the long drive back. Sean has one more day left before he has to return to the UK. So he and Spencer decide to visit a Maasai tribesman who lives just outside Arusha, on a hilltop with a view over the savannah, the land his forefathers had lived on for thousands of years. My name is Paya. I am a Maasai, and I live in the Lengijabe village. The Maasai, the Aza, they are rich Maasai. You can meet a Maasai has uh, 400,000 cattle, and they are selling view of them in order to get food to get clothing and for medical. The Maasai normally are not a farmer. Me, I have one, one wife and five children. And I'm a Christian, I start to be a Christian <laughs> now. And the Christian, they said, you must have one wife. The other Maasai, they, they, they have four wives, till 10, till 20. It depends on you if you have a lot of cattle. The Maasai children going to town to find their work, they leave their parent with the cattle. For the Maasai, you can go anyway. But nowadays, the, the other tribe coming to the Maasai places and start buying a land. It's, no, it's not good for the Maasai because they lose their places to, for grazing cattle. Not owning any cattle, Spencer doesn't have the right currency to buy a Maasai wife or two, so he continues his journey solo. Sean returns to the UK and Spencer loads his bike and rides out of this remarkable part of the world.
OK, I'm finally on the road at last. Um, I've just left Arusha and I'm heading towards the Malawi border. It's about 1,200 kilometres, but it's just brilliant to be on the road. Got the tyres fixed. Uh, unfortunately, I've got an off-road tyre on the front, so it's wobbling a bit at 140, 150, but I'm trying to keep below that. It's incredibly hot as well. It's about probably 32, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. To reach Malawi, Spencer's route will take him three days. First, he'll head towards Tanzania's largest city, Dar es Salaam, on the coast. Then he'll take a southwesterly course through the Mikumi National Park and then onto the border crossing at Songwe. Just about 60 kilometers from a place called Chilinze. I've just stopped at the side of the road just to get a bit of a break because uh, I came around the corner. I've been cruising at about 120, 130. It's going really well. Um, but I came around the corner and there was a truck on its side and uh, nearly, well, just missed it. So I don't know if you can see how much I'm sweating. <laughs> anyway, it's hot. I reckon 35. Someone told me it's a really, really hectic road down to um, Dar es Salaam. Hey, people talk rubbish, hey? Just don't listen to anyone, just do it. Come out here, come out here and do this. Right, it's day 90. Um, I just left a place called Chalinde. I stayed the night there, it was fine, no problems. Um, entering the Mikumi National Park, so I'm about 600 kilometers from the Malawi border, so that's pretty good. Great thing about this is one of the few national parks where you can take your motorbike in. Elephants about 100 meters from the road. This is superb. supposed to get off the bike, um, but I'm in a national park, so I just couldn't resist, because you can't get into any of the others. So if I get taken by a lion in a second, I mean, let's have a look. No, we're all right. Keeping the bike running so I can jump on if I have to. We've got all these famous game reserves, and this one's just stunning, and I've never even heard of it. Ever since I came into the Mikumi National Park, it's just the most beautiful. It's the biggest surprise so far on this trip, apart from the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia. The only thing is, as usual, uh, the bus drivers drive 120, 130 and almost push you off the road, but it's not affecting me at all. This is absolutely lovely. We've got long, sweeping bends. It's extremely green. The road is perfect. The bike's going well. I'm as fit as a fiddle. No, I am. I'm as fit as a fiddle, and it's all going well. Right, it's the end of my day. Uh, it's about quarter past four, I think. And I've just spotted a sign here for Riverside. What is it? Yeah, Riverside Campsite. So I'm going to head down here. It's a dirt road, it looks quite fun, so I'm going to put the helmet camera on and see what happens. The Riverside camping sign doesn't disappoint. Spencer pitches his tent by a river for his last night in Tanzania. Malawi is a landlocked country, flanked by Tanzania, Zambia and Mozambique. Spencer has entered Malawi at the Songwe River Bridge border. He plans to make his way down the west shore of Lake Malawi, travelling almost a thousand kilometres to the Mozambique border at Zobwe. I'm in a place called Candy Beach. It's halfway down Malawi. There's a little town called Chincheche, and it's just about 25 kilometers out of there. It's an absolutely beautiful place. I've done a couple of these campsites. This one is mainly for overlanders. This place is extremely well set up. It's even got like booths, berths, that's the word, for trucks. So they all pull in, they get out, they've got a covered area, um, they've got seating, all that sort of business. So yeah, very, very well organized, very plush. I'm camping, um, $5. Malawi's expensive, very expensive, but incredibly beautiful. 
You know what, Ted? Just when you thought uh, Africa couldn't get any more beautiful, God throws Malawi at you. It is beyond belief. It's absolutely stunning. It's mountainous, it's green, it's got rivers, it's got beaches, uh, it's got infrastructure, the roads are great, the people are great. It's the best country already. Uh, Ethiopia is my favourite, then Kenya, then Tanzania, now Malawi. I mean, things can't get better than this. Uh, the riding's amazing, absolutely amazing. Any bikers out there, take a holiday to Malawi. Uh, don't have to do the whole of Africa and be mad like me. Just get out there and try it out. Ow! Ah! Uh, bitten by something. So far, Spencer has managed to travel through nine countries in 94 days. He still has 22 countries to go if he's to fulfill his ambition of circumnavigating Africa. After 10 countries and four months on the road, Spencer Conway is 16,000 kilometers into his attempt to circumnavigate Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near fatal shooting and some of the world's toughest roads, but has experienced the diversity of Africa, from its deserts to its savannas and the people who live in this vast continent. He's now in Mozambique on the east coast of Africa as he heads south for Cape Town, the halfway point of his adventure. Okay, got through the Mozambique border without any problems, took about 15 minutes. I've been driving about 45 minutes into Mozambique and I've just come across a typical Mozambican village, I presume. As you can see, it's very green, very beautiful, but overcast today. And I've been joined by the Mozambican villagers. Here they all are. I just realised something today. I've really just been pushing it to get from uh, London to Cape Town because down the East Coast is what everybody does. Well, not what everybody does, but it just doesn't seem as important to me because Charlie Borman and Ewan McGregor have done it and quite a few people have done it, so there's nothing really new. The real challenge for me is going to be the West Coast and I guess I'm going to do a lot more coverage then, so we'll see how it goes. Spencer's route through Mozambique from the Malawi border crossing at Zobwe will take him through the interior to Chimoy. He will then follow the main highway along the coast to the capital Maputo. From there he plans to cross the border into Swaziland and then on to South Africa. But first he needs to cross the mighty Zambezi River at Tet. I'm in a tank called Tete, waiting for the bridge to open. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning. Just uh, gonna see this whole load of motorbikes, whole load of people, looks like they're doing roadworks. Hoping for an early start, but didn't get one. I don't know how many more close shaves I'm gonna have on this trip. I just killed a kid outright. Not a, not a child, a goatlet. I went all over the place like this. About five or six times swerving, I thought, oh my God, I'm coming off and this is going to be horrible. And I pulled it together. What a God, eh? Can you believe it? Anyway, it's another close shave. Going to be a few more, I'm sure there are. Spencer may be a God, but that doesn't protect him from having to endure some rough nights in Mozambique's low-budget accommodation. I didn't really get any sleep last night. Um, too many mosquitoes and too hot. Heading off to Inhamban, I'm onto the coast of Mozambique today. I've got 500 and something kilometers to go. Yeah, this is uh, the room and I'll show you the loo. Morning, it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning and I've been riding for about an hour and I've just seen a sign which says 819 kilometers to Maputo, which is the capital of Mozambique. So no big deal there. I could do that in two days if I wanted to, but I'm just going to check out the coast. I just saw some massive potholes. They can cause serious problems because even if you don't come off, if you hit them, it can ruin your rim and that affects the spokes and then the spokes can start snapping and fall off and the wheel can fall off and you can die. Okay, no, I'm not that serious, but you can get injured. So, you know, take these things seriously. Um, I've just come across a bridge. It's very, very slippery. It's uh, made of sheet steel. 
and obviously it had dew on it, so uh, another hazard you have to watch out for. And also, about 10 minutes earlier, there were a whole load of baboons, so you've got to be careful of those things. And sunburn, don't forget about that, because that's a constant problem here. Unfortunately, Spencer started to get problems with his camera, so he couldn't record any footage of the Mozambique coast. He makes it to Maputo without any further problems, where he gets his camera fixed and enters the small country of Swaziland. Swaziland only has a population of just over one million, and is a bit smaller than Wales. It gained independence from the British in 1968, and is a monarchy. Um, morning, I'm in Milwani, which is a game reserve in Swaziland, and it's basically it's run by a guy called Ted Riley. Now, this used to have a uh, big game in it, but unfortunately it's surrounded by a lot of urban area, and uh, there are a lot of poachers, so what they've done is they've moved them all up, but it's still a really, really pretty place. It's got all the small things like ostriches, warthogs, impalas, that kind of business. What Ted Riley did was he started this place oh, more than 40 years ago, and he was the first guy that really got an anti-poaching bill to come through the government. And it really meant, basically, that they could shoot anyone uh, who was caught poaching, which I kind of agree with, because you don't want to feed, you know, this Chinese market for rhino horn or whatever it is, just uh, for something as absurd as that and then losing your wildlife. One of these little hoop things is for per animal. So, I mean, if you can just imagine, we're running along here as I am. It's pretty unbelievable. Anyway, that gives you some sort of idea what they're fighting against. Not a good thing, is it? OK, it's time for me to move on to South Africa. Right, I'm in a place called Bethlehem. I'm about 300 kilometers from uh, Bloemfontein, and it's all going well, except I noticed something with my front wheel. As soon as I got up, within riding, within five minutes, I knew there was something wrong. I checked it, and I had a slow puncture, so I had to sort that out. You can feel it. You get to know your bike so well, even if there's just like a slight change. That's the great thing about uh, adventure riding, is that you do become one with the bike. Spencer is taking the most direct route across South Africa to Cape Town. After crossing the border and making it to Bethlehem, he will travel through Bloemfontein, Carlsberg, and cross the Karoo Desert to Cape Town. It's 1,700 kilometers, and he's planning to do it in two days. However, even on perfect roads, there are still hazards. As well as um, very, very, very fast drivers throughout Africa, there's also animals to contend with. And I think I might have mentioned before that I hit a, a goat. I nearly came off the bike. I'll just show you what we've got here, which could have been a bit, even a bit more of a hazard. OK, I've broken my own golden rule and I've decided to carry on riding. I've done 700 kilometres since this morning, but I've decided to do another 200 because uh, oh, the light's so beautiful and I want to get to a place called Colesburg, which means I've only got 800 k's to Cape Town. Spencer makes it to Colesburg and the next day he enters the Karoo Desert. But it turns out to be an unexpectedly strange experience for this seasoned traveller. Now, there's something about riding in the Karoo Desert that is really disconcerting. I don't know what it is, really. I've been um, in the Libyan Desert, I've been in the Egyptian Desert, but there's a different vibe here. It's sort of a vibe of death. Uh, it's, just, it's so hot, it's just scrubland. Uh, there are a few trucks coming by, but not many at all, and I don't feel that comfortable here. I'm just thinking all the time that I might run out of fuel. Despite his paranoia about running out of fuel, South Africa proves to be the least challenging leg of his trip. Although Cape Town signifies the halfway point of Spencer's journey, he now faces 20,000 kilometers up the west coast back to England, through some of the continent's most difficult and notorious countries.
OK, I finally arrived in Cape Town, which means I'm halfway towards my mission. But uh, it's kind of an anticlimax, really, because all the way along, I was planning a big speech on what I was going to say. But I, as far as I'm concerned, I feel as though I've done the easy bit and the difficult bits to come. Just to put it in a nutshell, I'll give you a few facts. I've driven 23,500 kilometers. Now, majority of people, they estimate from Cairo to Cape Town is about 10,000 kilometers. Uh, that just gives you some idea of how much off-road riding I've been doing as well. So it's been incredible. I've been through 14 different countries, which is 28 borders. The plan from now is to leave Cape Town and to head up to a place called Springbok, which is close to the border with Namibia. Then it's going to be Namibia, Angola, DRC, Gabon, Cameroon. And then from there, it's going to be a case of really really just working out which country you can get into and which ones you can't. Cape Town to Springbok is about 600 kilometers and is a straightforward road. Spencer makes good time and arrives before sunset. Booked into this guest house called Catnap. I don't know why it's called that, but it's a very nice place. The woman was a little bit strange. Uh, as soon as I arrived, she said, no drink, no drugs, no women. But then after that, she was friendly in her own sort of way. It cost 120 rand, which is, seems to be standard for dormitories in um, South Africa. Um, the basic setup is you've got this long room. She called it a barn. I'd call it a warehouse. But uh, set up all these beds along the side. Don't need blankets because actually, when I arrived here, it was it was cooling down a little bit, and it was 42 degrees. You got a cooker. Um, you got a, a, a fridge, and a fridge very, very important, obviously, because it's so hot. And uh, washing up area, and loads of utensils. So it's, it's a kind of a stop-off point to Namibia, which is where I'll be heading tomorrow. 149 kilometers to the Namibian border, 800 kilometers to Windhoek. So quite excited about seeing Namibia. Safely through the Namibian border, there's an immediate change of scenery and road conditions. Spencer's destination is the spectacular Fish River Canyon. But first, he picks up a friend and fellow traveler. I uh, met Carl on the junction to this place, which is uh, Fish River Canyon. Well, it's the bottom end of it, so it's not the main canyon section. But it was 80 kilometers of dirt road, and I've never seen weather like it. It started pouring with rain. So consider this. We've got the bike. We've got my luggage. We've got Carl perched on top of my luggage with a rucksack on, and me with his big rucksack on the front of the bike, on, on the tank. So pretty hectic. And basically, the side of the road turned into a complete river, and then they had rivers crossing it at junctions. Luckily, we managed to get a little bit of footage. So I ended up here. Going to try and take a hike tomorrow, see if we can get into the canyon. If not, we're going to leave on the bike and try and get up to the northern section of it and see what we can do over there. But brilliant, brilliant day. And the bike, obviously, as usual, made it. It's about quarter to seven in the morning, and it's, well, it must be about 25 degrees. The guard, when we arrived here, so that it gets up to about 52 degrees at this time of year. It's incredibly hot, but I like it like that. When I was in Malawi, I made friends with one of the local guys, and the night that I left, he, he came up and gave me a T-shirt. But unfortunately, because of lack of space, I've got to get rid of his T-shirt. So just for posterity, to put all the countries there. So I'm going to use it to check the oil on my bike, and then unfortunately it has to go in the bin. But it was a nice gesture anyway. So I'm going to head on now. It's only about 50 kilometers. Weather's perfect, so not going to face the torrential rain did yesterday. So it should be a nice, peaceful trip. Having Carl on board allows them to capture more of Africa's stunning scenery on camera as the duo make their way through Namibia. And I'm sitting on the edge of the Fish River Canyon, probably the most spectacular diary cam that I've done so far. The Fish River Canyon is in the south of Namibia, and obviously we're in the national park here. 
It's basically 145 kilometers long, at places it's 50 kilometers wide, and the Fish River has gouged out this canyon to a depth of about 550 meters in certain places, so it's a really spectacular place. Plan now is to head up to a, pla a place called Keatman's Hoop, which is in um, central Namibia, and it's famous for having a very, very large baobab forest. Namibia has the second lowest population density in the world because most of the country is desert. Although it's independent now, in 1884 it became a German colony. And in some areas, German is still spoken today. In a place called Cape Manshuop, this is an amazing place. It's called Quiver Tree Forest. Uh, quiver trees are, well, they're called kokaboom in Afrikaans, but they're amazing things. We're going to show you in a minute. Situation is this guy's got a farm. Um, it's not really a farm, it's a sort of guest house, that sort of thing, and a camping site. But he's got cheetahs, and uh, he has about six of them. One of them is lying a couple of hundred meters from here. We filmed it earlier, but it got attacked by a warthog, which I find surprising. I didn't even realize it would be that way around. I thought the cheetah would come out best. But he's been lying there for the last two days, but uh, amazingly beautiful creature. Um, also, these quiver trees, uh, this is what they call a quiver tree forest, but you must bear in mind that we're in a desert. So if you're thinking of forest, don't imagine it to be a forest. It's a few trees, but it's really, really stunning. About 50 degrees today, so really, really hot, completely sunburned. And we're lucky enough to be uh, camped over here, so you can see, I mean, you can't, you can't get a much better campsite than this. Isn't that pretty? With that background, uh, they've obviously, because it's Namibia, Namibia is very organized, so they've got all the facilities that you need, but it's still like being in the bush, which is really great. They've got toilets and showers, uh, bry area, like most of Southern Africa, very, very organized, but a really, really good spot. It's been a strange day and not a good one, really. Spoke to my family yesterday. Spoke to my girlfriend and my two girls and uh, my parents, and it made me a little bit depressed. Even though I've only been away four months, just over four months, uh, it brought it home to me how much I miss them. But I mean, I took on this project, so I've got to put up with it. The bad news is that uh, I have a small cut on my foot, but it's become infected. And I don't know if you can make out, my foot's gone a funny color and it's a different size to that one. I can't really bend my toes. They've all swollen up, so that's not good news. So I'm gonna to have to go to hospital when I get to Windhoek. The other thing is, which I'm very sad about, is that, well, I had my riding boots and I've had them through 15 countries now. Um, I've loved these boots and, well, they got a bit damaged in Ethiopia and I got a tailor to fix them, but then I got to stay in a container in Kenya um, at this truck workshop and they had a whole load of dogs and when I woke up in the morning my boots were missing and the dogs had attacked them so I think I'm gonna to have to throw them away it's a very sad day for me apart from that I have reached somewhere which is pretty cool Tropic of Capricorn and my bike so I mean that's a bit of a milestone With a big foot and crying about a pair of boots, Spencer and Carl make the 400-kilometer journey to Windhoek, the capital. Here, they hope to obtain their visas for the next countries and treatment for Spencer's big foot. Planning to go from here up to uh, the Skeleton Coast to do some desert riding and some filming there. So that's gonna be really excellent. Now, the problem is, that we're trying to get visas to go to Angola and DRC. Luckily, we got a visa for the DRC uh, almost immediately. It should be here in the next two days. The visa for Angola was a bit of a problem. We went there, the guy, the official behind the desk said no, basically. So what we did was we went to the British High Commission and we managed to get this. Now, this is an official letter from the High Commissioner which means the Angolan High Commissioner is going to be phoning us here at the Backpackers and arranging visas for us. On top of that is the fact that the British High Commission have also agreed to help us all the way through Africa. It's not just with visas, but if we have any trouble, any hassles, then we'll be able to sort that out.
In high spirits after receiving a British High Commission Freedom Pass, Spencer and Carl deviate from a direct route to Angola and head off to explore Namibia's famous skeleton coast. I've just stopped the bike because I've just, uh, kind of like a thunderbolt, realised how incredibly lucky I am to be doing this. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, I've been through 15, 16 countries. I've got another 18 to go. I mean, I'm not even halfway in it. It's, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, obviously, the shooting uh, put a real dampener on everything, but in a sense, I'm even luckier now because I'm experiencing these things. I'm not dead. And on top of that, uh, the interest from people and the support has been incredible. I've got some sort of weird obsession <laughs> with my boots. So the ones that I said I was going to throw away, I didn't. I splashed out 30 US dollars and this guy fixed them amazingly. Look at that. The Skeleton Coast name derives from whale and seal bones that once littered the coastline from the whaling industry. In modern times, it's littered with shipwrecks caused by offshore rocks and fog but it's also home to some amazing wildlife. I'm up in uh, Cape Cross. It's one of the biggest Cape fur seal uh, communities in the world. Uh, I'm actually quite stunned and don't really know what to say. I've never seen anything like it before. You can see the different colorings. The darker black ones, they happen to be pups. Uh, the mating season's around December period, so they're generally three to four months old at this stage. Most of the deaths that occur, occur during the first six weeks, but obviously they're not having a problem here. Uh, there's a stench, but that's obviously because there's so many of them. But just have a look. With the stench of seal breath in their nostrils, Spencer and Carl leave the Skeleton Coast and head for Oshikango, the border town with Angola. OK, we're 200 kilometres from the border with Angola. We've had quite a funny evening. Uh, we're actually filming from a toilet. Uh, Carl's eating some bry that uh, we started, and then we went into the... It's kind of like a guest house, but not really. We asked for some food, but this woman said, uh, no, nope, you can't have any food. And she was incredibly rude, and she basically told us, if you wanted to go camping, then we need to know that it's going to rain sometime, and you may as well go and eat under the stoop outside, which is like a little enclosure outside this toilet. So we just decided that we would come in. So anyway, here's, here's the scene. <laughs> See, it's, very, it's quite smart. We managed to find some chairs, and we got a bottle of red wine, and this is basically our place for the night, if it doesn't stop. Damn it. It's from the storm. After a night in the toilet, sheltering from the weather, Spencer picks up his bedraggled bike, packs up his soaking tent, and heads for the Angola border. Little did he know this was going to be the last footage of this leg of the journey. Africa tax was about to bite. After 14 countries and six months on the road, Spencer Conway is 27,000 kilometers into his attempt to circumnavigate Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near-fatal shooting, rough accommodation, and treacherous roads, but has experienced the diversity of Africa, from its deserts to its savannas, and the people who live in this vast continent. He's now in Angola on the west coast, and is about to face some of Africa's most difficult countries. He's with fellow traveler Carl. They've recently had an incident at the border. Okay, a lot has happened since the last diary cam and some unfortunate things again. In the border town of Oshikango in Santa Clara, 
My bag got stolen and I lost the HD camera. So there's no footage from Santa Clara up to where I am now in Luanda outside the Save the Children office. Been here for a couple of days, waiting for new credit cards, waiting for a new camera to arrive, and this is the first diary cam on that camera. Hopefully from here on, from Luanda up to the border with DRC, it's known to be a beautiful area, so we should be able to get some good footage over there. I'm still so disappointed about the fact that I haven't had any footage. I mean, along with, um, along with Swaziland and Ethiopia, uh, Angola is by far my favorite. It's exciting, the people are interesting, and the fact of the matter is they've been through like a 20-year war, and the, the strength of the people and the fact that they remain so friendly and so open to foreigners is just incredible. It's supposed to have more guns than any other country in the world. In 1999, the World Health Organization said that it had, um, the, it was the worst place in the world for a child to grow up. I can't see that, I can't understand that. After leaving Luanda, Spencer intends to travel to a town called Weech and then on to the border crossing with the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC for short. From there, he'll continue to the notorious capital Kinshasa and take the ferry across the infamous River Congo to Brazzaville and enter the Congo Republic. It's roughly 850 kilometers, and Spencer hopes it'll take him and Carl three days. So this is the typical sort of view all the way up here. It's just winding roads, very, very, very green. It's about 35 degrees centigrade. So it's pretty hot in the bike gear. Came across this, which is an adder, and it's just got the most amazing colors. Unfortunately, it's dead, but just check out this. There's his eyes, you can see the blue eyes and the wide head. That's the arrow-shaped head. Um, very fat, like a puff adder, but I mean, that's the kind of thing that I want to see alive. Obviously not biting me, but alive. Anyway, I'll put him down on the road and we're going to, I'm going to crack on, but that is just an amazing creature. So you have to stay in the room. And this is a typical sort of room. It's not that clean and it's without water. Now, what you'll find in every single place is these big buckets next to the sinks. The sinks generally don't have any water. The toilets, you get a smaller bucket so that you can uh, blast water through. And there's a typical toilet. It's actually fairly clean compared to most of them. But it seems like Angola, despite the fact that it rains all the time, they don't have water pipes through. And there's me filming. So yeah, they're not very classy and it's 60 US dollars for a room. After a $60 bucket of water, Spencer and Carl leave Weege and head for the DRC but progress is slow as the road starts to become increasingly challenging. Okay, one thing I haven't focused on really is the food when you're traveling around Africa. Now, try and get into the local food because it's all part and parcel of the whole traveling experience. An obvious thing to buy is bread because bread is everywhere. And um, a little bit heavy for bikes, but very, very handy. Most countries have some sort of fish in cans, like sardines or tuna, so you can eat those. And then, obviously, local produce. I mean, the avocados you get in Southern Africa are absolutely fantastic. And then, obviously, there's mangoes, bananas, apples, every, every single fruit you can imagine, so for you to get your healthy kick. And more importantly than all of those things, liquids. Always carry water with you because it, it may not seem tiring on a bike, but you're riding in gear like this. It can be very, very hot and you sweat a great deal. So make sure you've always got at least two liters and every village you stop at, get more water. Okay, I'm just going through a really rough patch at the moment. 
Uh, it's hectic, very tired, sore hands, sore feet. There's only about 25 kilometers to go, but if it carries on like this, it's gonna take a couple of hours because it's very slippery. I've let the tires down a little bit, and every now and then you get things like this. And if the bike goes in there, well, you're done for, aren't you? That's the road ahead, so let's go see what happens. With the road getting worse and daylight running out, Spencer and Carl are forced to stop and find somewhere to stay. But in this remote part of Angola, they're in for an interesting night. It's absolute chaos here. We've ended up sleeping in the police station. The police have got loads of women there. Uh, they're all completely drunk. It's, it's madness. It's the most African I've ever been in. There were people fighting over helping us. There was a massive fight in the street, full on corruption, full on drunkenness, army driving through crowds of people at 120 kilometers an hour, uh, mosquitoes everywhere, spiders everywhere, snakes everywhere. But yeah, what a crazy place. Right, the town we were in last night where we stayed with the police, the town was called Makela de Zombo, and uh, we're heading to the border town of Banza Soso. So I reckon I'm about 10 kilometers from there right now, and I come across this beautiful, beautiful river, which is obviously in full flow because it's rainy season. Right. Okay, I just came off in the mud, uh, broken off the foot stand, and the pannier is smashed off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take everything off and see if I can fix it. This is the state of the spring that holds the footrest. Now, you might not think it's important, but it has to go back on, because otherwise the footrest will bounce, bounce down and you'll get caught in the mud and I'll come off again. One of the most important things that you can take, one of the most important things is tape and cable ties. Because when things break, it's a great temporary way of fixing them. So got lost uh, on the way to the Congo border, had to come back 18 kilometers. And now there's a tiny little path near a village where I have to uh, turn off and I'm going to put the helmet camera on because you won't believe this is the main road to the Congo border. This is the toughest day I've faced so far. I've just come off again. Um, went the wrong way. Still got 16 kilometers to the border. But I'm on this path. There's holes and you can't see them. There's my boot under there. But it looks like the pannier survived this time. If you were here, this is what you'd want for television. I tell you, it's, it's ridiculous. This is on the Michelin maps. It's not a road at all. So just having my lunch, after falling off three, four times, don't know. And I'm impressed. No broken legs, no broken arms, just one injury. Man. Isn't that pretty? It's not putting me off my lunch, though. After tough roads and getting lost, fuel is becoming an issue. The only way to get petrol in these remote areas is to stop in a village, order a delivery, and wait. But this isn't Spencer's only problem. It's the 15th of April, the morning of the 15th of April, about 8 o'clock. I'm still waiting for the guy to come with the petrol. I tried to film this morning just outside the village and by pure bad luck, a commander from the police uh, came past and asked us if we were journalists now. I said no, um, but he came to the house we were staying at and told us that we were filming in a military zone. I've heard this story before. Okay, we're near the border, but we walked you know, a kilometer or two and uh, it looks like they're gonna cause some sort of trouble. So the petrol hasn't arrived, so we've decided to leave anyway. Luckily, 
We left uh, because we were worried about the police and all that sort of business and the army and filming there. But we met the guy with the petrol on the way and uh, as he came towards us, he said, c'est moi, c'est moi, it's me, it's me. But as usual, these guys don't like being filmed. I don't know what they think it is. Okay, I've made a decision, a really harsh decision. I've decided to throw away the panniers. Uh, it's got to one of those situations where it's needed. Uh, they've, they're both broken. I've fallen off about five or six times in the last couple of days. I'm just on this ridiculous track. There's no space on either side. So what I'm going to try and do is whittle it down and I'm going to leave the panniers here for someone. But uh, it's, when it comes to a difficult situation like this, you just have to forget about these material things and just try and bring it down to almost nothing. So this is the last footage where you'll ever see those panniers on my motorbike. But that's just the way it goes. OK, au revoir. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Had my uh, phew, eighth accident. Hit the same damn elbow, look at that. So annoying. That's where I fell off. Came over that lump into this and slipped. Through sweaty perseverance and dogged determination, Spencer and Carl finally make it to the border crossing into the Democratic Republic of Congo. Just in DRC, and uh, we're just getting some petrol from these nice guys. Uh, they've got private petrol, so we've had seven litres, probably need another ten. There's loads of kids around, it's unbelievable. I'm, uh, I'm an attraction. OK, I started riding at nine o'clock, and it's now four o'clock, and I've done 37 kilometres and I really don't think I can carry on. Um, I'm shattered. My arms are not working properly. It's just unbelievable. It's the 15th of April and this is by far the most difficult ride I've had on this trip. Actually, it's the most difficult ride I've had in my life. It's uh, basically it's a motocross track and it was pouring with rain um, and I don't have a motocross bike. I've only got an adventure bike. Once again, I've run out of water. I've had bloody eight litres of it or something and you, you just sweat. It is so humid here. But I'm get, making my way, I'm making my way. I'm getting to Kinshasa. It's 160 k's. I've done brilliant today. I've done about 40. Right, I'm about uh, 60 kilometres, 100, sorry, 140 kilometres from uh, Kinshasa and had to camp here in the night. It's absolutely boiling hot. Look at my hair. It must be about 35, 40 degrees, but it's so humid. I was told there was a good bit of road and then it just became dreadful again. I suppose they've got nothing to compare it to, really. But I uh, couldn't face it anymore and it started getting dark, so I just found a space in a field, well, a field in the bush. Right, uh, got off on off the dirt road finally, and it's only uh, 90 k's to Kinshasa on a perfectly tar road. This is something that you have to consider if you're going to go on a trip like this. You are going to have down days. The mantra that I use is nothing is forever. Nothing lasts. So if you're in a situation you don't like, just think, OK, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, but I'm not going to be in this situation. It's going to improve. And take everything day by day. That's the way I look at things. Right, I'm in the DRC, I'm in Kinshasa, and I'm very proud of it. I came through the border called Kisama, which almost nobody knows about. Most people go through the Matadi border, and I decided to risk it and go for the really, really tough roads, and how pleased am I? When I'd made it all the way through, the border guard said that he hadn't seen a European for three years. 
Kinshasa, they reckon 6.7 million, but uh, an unofficial estimate is that there's 12 million people here. It's dirty, it's grimy, it's hot, it's dusty, but it's a really exciting place. much everyone is trying to make a living on the street and it's constant constant hassle the police are everywhere so you might get a couple of shots of Kinshasa but it's extremely difficult and I can't afford to lose my camera again and I don't really want to go to jail here because it would be a bit grim. Leaving his traveling buddy Carl in Kinshasa Spencer crosses the mighty river Congo to Brazzaville the capital of the Congo Republic where he finds a curious place to pitch his tent. It's 6.30 in the morning on the 12th of May, my birthday, and um, I feel completely unrefreshed. I didn't sleep for even five minutes. I started off in my tent, but it was boiling, boiling hot. Must have been over 30 degrees inside the tent. And uh, unfortunately, there was a tiny little hole in my mosquito section, and they seemed to be coming through in single file until there were thousands in there. So then I decided to sleep on the floor, but then when I slept on the floor, there were cockroaches everywhere. So then after that, um, I changed and I slept on the table. And you might find yourself in funny places like this, sleeping on a restaurant table in Brazzaville in the Congo. But that's the great thing about traveling. After an uncomfortable night with unwelcome bedmates, Spencer leaves Brazzaville. His route through Congo will take him west to Dolisi and then north to Mosenjo. From there, he hopes to travel to Dosala, the border crossing into Gabon. It looks like I'm back to DRC site road. I've got 280 kilometers to go, and it looks like I'm gonna do about 30 a day. So it's gonna be a long haul, maybe a week or so, maybe longer. It's very slippery, and I've just come off again. I can't pick the bike up. I'm going to have to work on that one. After finding the strength to pick up his bike, it's not long until this brutal road catches him out again. As you can see from uh, well, my face, it's, it's hot, I'm sweating. This is a really tough section again. Don't know if you can see that. Just a small pothole in the road. Uh, that's uh, one reason for not driving at night. And the bike's just a little bit muddy, eh? So I'm not expecting to make much progress today. I've got to set myself a task of trying to do 30 or 40 kilometers. Uh, the last bit of footage, you saw me fall off, but I was okay, so that's the main thing. Okay, I'm gonna carry on for another half hour. You gotta take breaks all the time, otherwise you lose concentration. <laughs> The road starts to improve, and Spencer makes good progress towards the Gabon border, lifting his spirits. At the moment, I'm absolutely loving this. I'm in the middle of the Congo jungle. <coughs> I only see people every now and then. And what's making it so much better is they're all brilliant, really, really nice people, waving, helping. Um, when I came off, they ran and helped me. They didn't ask for anything. The old cigarette, that's it. So that's absolutely great. The road's getting so much better, so I can make progress now, but I'm not gonna count my chickens because when you do that, it gets really, really bad really quickly. But loving it today, loving it. Just hope the bike holds out. I've turned up in a village, Mandingo, and I managed to do 240 kilometers in Ten and a half hours, eleven hours, so it's pretty amazing, and I'm absolutely shattered, but I feel fantastic. And I couldn't bring myself to camp because this room is five dollars. I mean, it's just you can see behind; it's just a bed. So, well, that's all really. I'm just shattered, but I feel brilliant. I recommend this to anybody who can afford it or can get the time off or, you know, has really wanted to do it, just, just do it. It's, it's just incredible to be on your own, 
all day riding with your thoughts, with the beautiful scenery. There's nothing to beat it. I could do it for the rest of my life. I'm driving along thinking, hey, this is going well. I'm pretty good at this. This guy comes past me on like a AG200 with like biscuits for wheels. When I went round the corner, he'd stopped and he was waiting for me and uh, he wanted to show me another route because apparently a bridge had collapsed on the route that I was going to take. So it wasn't that cool of him and he took me all on the back routes and uh, we avoided this area. And his name was Philippe, I got a photo of him there. Uh, excellent, that was an excellent little snippet of activity, loved it. OK, I'm about uh, 60 kilometres from the border with Gabon, which is absolutely incredible. I never imagined it. Now, um, the road is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I can't believe it. And I'm sorry, I might have corned beef between my teeth. I do apologise, I just had a little snack. In a day's riding, if you're having a long, long day, you have three sort of uh, different stages. The first stage is when you first start, the first sort of 15, 20 minutes, which I call the warm-up. And you're actually not riding very well. You're riding a bit stiff and, uh, you know, you need to get into it. And then after that, within half an hour, you're starting to get into the rhythm of things. If you've ridden, you'll know what I'm talking about. And the third stage is when you find yourself sort of tightening up on the handlebars and, uh, you know, just losing concentration, hitting things things that you wouldn't normally. So just bear in mind those three different stages and try and recognize them. Now, I know you're sick of the helmet camera, but it's only because I'm so enthusiastic about this whole thing. It's absolutely incredible. So far, Spencer Conway has managed to travel through 16 countries in 190 days. His ride through the next 22 countries will take him into the chaos of Nigeria, the tough roads of Guinea, and the harsh winds of Mauritania. After seven months and 28,000 kilometers on the clock, Spencer Conway is three quarters of the way through his attempt to circumnavigate Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near fatal shooting, theft, rough accommodation and treacherous roads. But he's also experienced the beauty and the people of this vast continent. Because of the tough roads in the Congo Republic, he was forced to abandon most of his luggage. So traveling light with just a tent and dirty underwear he enters Gabon. Okay, good morning. Sorry I'm looking so bleary eyed. It's about half past six in the morning and I've, I'm about 40 kilometers into Gabon. Last night I stopped just outside the border post because it was getting late. Once again, it's a dirt road, but it's perfect. And guess who's doing it? The Chinese. It seems like in 10 years time, you'll be able to go around Africa on tar roads all the way if you want to, which is excellent for the countries that are involved. But you wonder at what price, um, what their debt's gonna be to the Chinese, whether they've uh, signed, the, signed off their mineral rights or logging rights or God knows what, but that's the way of the world. After crossing the border at Isala, Spencer's route across Gabon will take him towards the capital, Libreville. He then plans to travel north, avoiding Equatorial Guinea, to the Cameroon border crossing near Bitam. It's about 900 kilometers, and if there are no delays, it should take Spencer two days. I'm well aware that a lot of people that watch this will think, where are all the people? Where are all the local people? Where's all the mixing? Um, and I completely understand that. This, well, I'll give you a couple of reasons. One reason is obviously it's sparsely populated here. The second reason is the route that I'm taking. I'm not going through the major cities. I'm not doing all the tourist attractions. But the third reason, and I completely admit it, is me. Obviously, everyone goes on a trip like this to try and find themselves. And that wasn't what I was trying to do at all. I wanted to face the challenge and try and make it. So I do apologize if you're looking for an anthropological sort of uh, program, but uh, it's, it's just, it's not me. Breaking the news that he will not be stopping to hang out with the locals, ingest their hallucinogenic drugs, or do a tribal dance with a feather up his bottom, Spencer pushes on through Gabon's interior, only stopping for lunch. 
So far the route here has been pretty un uninspiring. It's all sort of flat. It's not tropical, it's not savannah. It's not hot, it's not cold. It's a weird place. Pretty uninspiring at the moment. They got good corned beef though. Very good. While clearly impressed by the quality of Gabon's corned beef, Spencer is less impressed by its landscape. He makes good time traveling through the country and enters Cameroon, where the landscape dramatically changes. Okay, I'm on the ring road uh, in sort of western Cameroon, lower western Cameroon, and heading around, uh, this ring road is 360 kilometers long, but we're just gonna do a certain section of it. I'm here with Mike, a friend of mine who I met along the way. He's traveling independently, but for day today he's uh, come on the bike. We're heading down towards a place called Abbey Waterfall. Got no idea what it's like, but this area is really, it's made up of crater lakes and uh, waterfalls and a lot of rivers and very, very beautiful scenery. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit of it now. The great thing about Cameroon is that it's not really geared towards tourists that much. So you can turn up and you can have an amazing thing that I've just found here, which is known as the Abbey Waterfalls. There's absolutely no sign whatsoever. There's no one there asking for money or anything. You just walk through this strange sort of backwoods um, with this kind of, there's a derelict building here. And right there is uh, some beautiful, beautiful waterfalls. With all this water around, Spencer and his new buddy Mike decide to get off the bike and explore by canoe. Uh, this is called Lake Awing. There's a bit of wobbling, I'm afraid. We're in a pirogue that we managed to sort out ourselves. Uh, it was totally waterlogged and full of reeds, so we emptied it out and we're on the water, but it's pretty shaky around here. A uh, lake called Lake Neos is very famous. It's near here, but unfortunately we can't get there because there's a bridge that's collapsed. It is famous because it released a vapour, uh, basically noxious gases that killed 1,800 people. The other thing that this area is famous for is palm wine. I haven't been so lucky to try that yet. The main reason is because I'm riding a motorbike. And palm wine plus motorbike equals serious injury. Back on the bike, Spencer ventures into town for a bit of Cameroon hospitality and succumbs to the local brew of palm wine. I'm not going to drink more than one, but what I've done is back up. I've got this for when I get <laughs> After a full of palm wine and parting company with Mike, he's back on the road travelling north. But the going's getting tough. OK, I've left Mamenda and I'm heading to the Nigerian border of Ekok and it's looking pretty bad. Now, I'm told that the road after Manthe to the border of Nigeria is probably the worst road in Africa. So it looks like this 150k is going to take me five or six hours. Once again, the Chinese are doing up the road, so the road has got a little bit better. Unfortunately, just before that, I had a little tumble. There was a drop about 100 foot down one side, and then there was a big gully, and I hesitated. And hesitation leads to disaster, and I fell. Uh, I think I've sprained my wrist. It's a bit sore, I don't know. Sort of a bit bent. With a limp wrist, he enters the most populated country in Africa, Nigeria. And it seems the entire population has turned out to give him a warm welcome. OK, good morning. It's day 220 on my trip, and I'm in Lagos in Nigeria. Um, I'm leaving today to go to Benin, and it's been absolutely mad. Nigeria is supposed to be larger than life. A lot of people told me you're not going to believe it when you get there, and it's absolutely true. I've literally been swept away by the place. Um, there's been non-stop attention. Now, mainly due to a guy called Charlie Boy, who's also known as the Area Father. Um, because he controls all the motorbikes, uh, he provides motorbikes for people. He's a film star, he's, a, he's got his own TV show. But uh, he organised press conferences galore. I must have been in 10 newspapers. 
I uh, must have been on TV five or six times. People recognize me in the street, and which is kind of weird with 160 million people, that people come up to you and say, I saw you on TV, but I've been on all the main TV channels. OK, the La Cocha boys, let's hear it now. Yeah. And uh, thanks to them also, I've uh, been put up in, well, this is a five-star hotel for here. And just out of interest, I went and asked how much it is. It's 125 US dollars a day. And uh, Charlie Boy's put me up here for three nights, so how nice of him, eh? Uh, the only uh, downside was that from Abuja to Lagos, I didn't manage to do any filming because there was a convoy and we were rushing to get to Lagos for two o'clock, so it was just non-stop speeding with completely crazy drivers. So, and once again, I'll be sad to leave. OK, good morning. It's my first full day in Benin, and it's exciting. Um, I'm on the beach. I'm at a place called Wida, which has a population of about 30,000. It's, uh, it's the voodoo center of Benin, and I've already come across loads of symbols and statues and that sort of thing. There's a village quite near here called Ganvi, which is very famous and uh, overrun by tourists because the houses are built on sticks because uh, in the water. There was a period where there was a lot of fighting going on, Dahomey as it was then, and the Fon people decided to escape and live on stilts in the middle of the water because it was uh, part of the religious custom of their their enemies that they didn't touch water. So that was the only place they were safe and it ended up being a permanent resident. <laughs> I've just arrived in Togo. Uh, border was a bit of a hassle, actually. They wanted a visa, even though I don't think you need a visa. And that cost me 20 US dollars. The guy was a bit rude, actually, which is surprising, because Benin was really excellent. Pity they couldn't give me more than 48 hours. It was just one long, beautiful beach along the coast, and I could have stayed there forever. So I'll just give you a, give you a quick view. I'm in a very, very good mood. I'm in Ghana. Uh, everyone I've met has been absolutely brilliant. Hello. Everyone's been brilliant. Very, very friendly. Glad I got out of Togo, even though I had no choice because I couldn't get any money, but the vibe wasn't good. But I had to stop here because it's a famous, famous river, the Volta. Uh, I didn't even know where it was, but here it is, uh, the lower Volta. So I suppose I'm going to reach the upper Volta at some point. After leaving Cameroon, Spencer's route took him to the Nigerian capital, Lagos. From there, he travelled along the coast into the small countries of Benin and Togo. Now in Ghana, his plan is to travel to its capital, Accra, and then to Burkina Faso, avoiding the Ivory Coast, which is not issuing visas. I'm in Accra, in the capital of Ghana, and I found a room for about $7. It's pretty rough, it's pretty basic. There's no toilet, there's no shower. It's in a derelict building, and it's actually a brothel. There's about 50 prostitutes here. As you can see, it's not the cleanest. There's my water for washing and showers, and there's the bed on the floor, and the curtains. I don't think they've been cleaned for a while. After a dirty night with noisy neighbours, Spencer leaves Accra and heads up the coast, which has a morbid history. I'm on the Cape Coast, and the Cape Coast is basically from Accra all the way to Ivory Coast, running along the coastal route, obviously, and that's where um, a lot of slavery went on, and in fact, they've got loads of forts all the way along here, uh, one after another after another, which were used not just for protection and for trading and that, but they were also used to literally brand and count the slaves. So that's pretty horrible. This is probably my last report from Ghana. Each time I cut something off or finish up a country now, I really feel like I'm just ticking it off. So it's coming to an end, which means exciting things like 
seeing signs like this are gonna be a thing of the past and it's gonna be like Ashford Maidstone instead of this. I wanna finish Africa, actually finish it, all 54 countries before anywhere else, because it's too stunning. After offending the people of Ashford and Maidstone, Spencer makes a tearful exit from Ghana and enters Burkina Faso. OK, I've been in Burkina Faso for about 20 minutes and it's uh, brilliant. Everybody's waving to me, everybody's smiling. And in fact, there's two kids behind me right now. Hello. Ça va? Excellent. And obviously the language barrier is not a problem for me because I speak French like Charles de Gaulle, so I'm all right. Charles de Gaulle. Bonjour, madame. Ça va? Excellent. Spencer entered Burkina Faso at the border crossing at Pago. His route will then take him across the interior and then into Mali at the Kadira border. From there, he'll travel to Bamako, the capital, and then on to Guinea. But first, he wants to fulfill a strange childhood dream. OK, I can finally say it. Uh, a childhood dream, absolutely. I'm in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso. Uh, what a great thing to say. It's a pit. It's such a pit. Just got myself some Burkina Faso street food. That is a piece of fish. And then you get rice with black beans. And I also managed to um, get some stuff to freshen up. So I got Angola. It's most effective. Feeling fresh after a mouthful of Angola, Spencer's now spruced up, ready to charm the Mali embassy into giving him a visa. OK, it's my second day in Burkina Faso, and it's uh, half past seven. I just found the embassy for Mali. So I'm all sorted, ready to go there. They open at eight. And then if you can see, it's uh, what I'm going to show you in a minute, but it's quite a progressive place uh, in the fact that they've got cycle lanes. Probably the only place in the whole of Africa that's got cycle lanes. And if you can see there. So the Teletubbies are popular here as well, eh? Revealing an unhealthy knowledge of children's television, Spencer sets off to Bamako in Mali. It's about 850 kilometers and should take two days. I've driven about 150 kilometers through Mali. Now I'm feeling pretty guilty because I haven't been filming, but and it sounds really spoiled, but it's all pretty much the same. It's just scrubland, uh, obviously more green than it normally is because of the rainy season, but it's right up to the side of the road. I heard a story when I was in Cape Town about a couple who'd saved up for many years to go from Morocco to Cape Town. And uh, their trip came to a very quick end in Mali when they hit a cow. How do you hit a cow? Unless you're riding at night, or unless you're going too fast. I just can't understand it, really. Aware of Mali's deadly kamikaze cows, Spencer pushes on cautiously to Bamako. OK, I'm 12 kilometres outside Bamako and uh, just had a shower, so I feel great. Uh, I came here because I heard they've got camping, but when I arrived, the owner said that the camping has been closed down because uh, a couple got mugged and robbed. It's pretty gruesome, but, well, it's not gruesome, have a look. Up there, I don't know what snakes or, or what they've got in there. Uh, I've got a mosquito net there, which is a lovely shade of brown. And then this is my bathroom. There's no light, which is probably a good thing. Get some soap, which was used. Uh, Andre, the owner, just turned up and uh, brought me my lighting for my room, which consists of jump cables, a light on a stick, and, of course, a battery. So you just stick on the terminals, and voila, lighting for the room. <laughs> ah, look at the size of it. I may as well sit around a cigarette. Today was about 42 degrees. Unbelievable. 
Anyway, I'm heading off tomorrow towards the Futa Jalon mountains in um, Guinea. I should make it by tomorrow evening, but we'll see how it goes. See that fly? In my nose everywhere. Africa. Um, yesterday I saw a snake uh, crossing the road really, really quickly. And uh, unfortunately, that's the thing about snakes. You only find them if you really, really want to see them. You find them dead. Look at the size of that. And it is a big, big snake. I'll go back a bit. But just look at those colors. Beautiful. There we go. I'm in Guinea at the moment, having a really horrible day. One of the worst days. I'm not enjoying myself at all. Uh, the road's annoying. It's uh, non-stop turns. It's really, really torturous progress. There's potholes everywhere. Uh, the place isn't organized, so they've got no petrol. I nearly ran out. Um, there's no food around. Yeah, sorry to be such a spoiled brat, but I just don't feel good. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't feel like I've achieved anything. I feel, I don't know, I don't know how I feel. It's just bloody awful. Come on, you're not a cow. You do score. Decided to stop her for a while to sort of calm down a little bit. Um, I've been driving way too fast, uh, partly because I've been in a bad mood, really bad mood. Decided to have some food. That is uh, black beans with pasta and it was wrapped in her child's homework I suppose I don't know what it is so anyway I'm gonna dig into that obviously with the proverbial sardines just try and relax a little bit from the border crossing at Kure Mali Spencer's route through Guinea will take him towards the Hope Niger National Park then east through the interior onto the mountainous region of the foot of Jalon. from there he'll travel north to the Senegal border the reason I'm not having such a good time in Guinea is because, well, it's probably got something to do with the fact that everybody's trying to kill me. And uh, that's not paranoia. It's the driving is unbelievable, especially the taxis, the yellow taxis. And I was thinking about it, and lo and behold, I came around a corner, and obviously this guy has had a head-on with this guy. And I doubt if either of them survived. I'm sure he's not a taxi driver anymore. OK, it's 6.30 in the morning. Um, I'm up really early. I've packed already. I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm in the Futa Jalon Mountains in uh, central Guinea. And I'm in a place called Dalabe, where I stopped for the night because uh, I wanted to be prepared to leave really, really early because apparently I'm facing one of the worst roads in Africa. But we shall see. Excited by the prospect of tackling one of Africa's toughest roads, Spencer's bad mood lifts. He mans up and takes on the challenge. I've done 150 k's in five hours. I've got another 100 k's to go, so I'm going to make it to the border with uh, Senegal today. It's been amazing, amazing, amazing. I've got a rash on my arm. I don't know if you can see it, but that's from the heat. Ah, oh, brilliant. Love it. Not going to beat me, not going to beat my bike. I'm going to make it. Hardly anyone around. Feel like I'm in real, real Africa again. Seen some monkeys. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I'm uh, 20 kilometers from Kundera, which is the final sort of major town before the border with Senegal. But the reason I feel so privileged is because the three toughest rides I've had. The first one was uh, northern Kenya, Moyale to Masabit. The second one was uh, the Congo. And then the third one was today. Now, the reason I feel so privileged is that the Kenya route won't exist because it'll just be tar. And lo and behold, this is being tarred as well. 
So it looks like next year those two routes won't exist. Well, they'll exist, but they'll be easy. And I do feel sorry for people who are really into adventuring. They're missing it on two beautiful routes. But the Makela de Zombo route, that will not be done for many, 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 many years. It's, it's not even a path. So that's the one to go for. In the next episode, Spencer Conway pushes on with the final leg of his extraordinary journey, crossing seven borders from Senegal to the UK. He will experience harsh desert conditions and faces the reality of returning home to normality. After nine months and a staggering 48,000 kilometers, Spencer Conway is on the final leg of his epic journey solo around Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near fatal shooting, theft, rough accommodation and treacherous roads. But he's also experienced the beauty and the people of this vast continent. Traveling light after leaving most of his gear in the Congo Republic, Spencer enters Senegal with just a toothbrush and dirty pants. Just arrived in Senegal about 10 minutes ago, and uh, surprise, surprise, the national highway marked on the Michelin map as a tarred sealed road is, voila, a dirt road full of corrugation. After crossing the border at Madak, Spencer's route through Senegal will take him to the capital, Dakar, for bike repairs and visas. From there, he hopes to travel to San Louis, and then on to the Mauritanian border crossing at Rosso. OK, I'm 180 kilometres from Dakar, and not a good start to the day. For some unknown reason, sometimes you can't explain these things, my chain snapped. All modern bikes have got these grooves on them where you can adjust the wheel to change the tension on the chain. Make sure it's exact, otherwise the wheel's not aligned properly, but I think the bearings are I think there's lots of things wrong. Yeah, I'll tell you what, eh, that chap upstairs with a beard, uh, God, Allah, Jah, whatever his name is, he must have a real sense of humour. I mean, I go 42,000 kilometres to get to Dakar, which is the place that's the most famous motorbike race in the world, and I'm on the motorbike that won it, and I'm limping in there at 60 kilometers an hour. It's, you know, I like a challenge. I really don't mind it at all, but the, the problem is it's the cost. Arriving in the busy streets of Dakar, our weary traveler checks into some luxury accommodation with an aircon unit, an ensuite bathroom. Hey, nice shot. Right, I'm in Dakar, in Senegal. I've arrived and I've got myself an apartment and a half. This is my lounge, I suppose. And the master bedroom, that's it. And a television, look, can you believe it? Out there is Dakar. Immersion. After a few days, the bike repairs are done, visas obtained, and with fresh underwear, Spencer is back on the road, traveling north to Mauritania, but not in the best of moods. I've left Dakar and tell you the truth, I'm absolutely shattered. For the first time, I don't know, it's really taken it out of me. And I got myself into a bit of trouble. Um, basically, these three guys came up to me, well, sat at my table, and they uh, just started ordering food and drink. And then when it came to me leaving, they insisted that I had to pay, and then they told the waitress that I'd agreed to pay for them. I refused, I wandered off, and they came and started pushing me around, so I hit two of them. But unfortunately, the police were there immediately and ended up paying 120 euros, or I would have had to go to court. All right, I better go, because there's a car here, and I think I'm probably on someone's land. Avoiding court on 120 euros lighter, Spencer continues to San Louis, but his day is not improving. It's the first time in Africa that I've ever driven to find a pretty place um, to eat my lunch and gave up. It's a hellhole. I really didn't expect it in Senegal. But look at that. Tuna. Mayonnaise. 
baguette. So I'm gonna tuck in. Mm. With a belly full of baguette, the troubles of the past few days evaporate and morale is high as he arrives at his next destination. OK, I'm in Saint Louis, which is the city in the northern section of Senegal. Now, it's a real, real surprise. Now, the weird thing about it is that during colonial times, it's divided, it's got the mainland and then a small island of about 12 kilometres long and then connected by a bridge. Now, this island that I'm on used to be the White Island during colonial times, and it's got incredible French architecture, wrought iron, you know, verandas, all that sort of thing, and it's very, very peaceful by African standards. Whereas the sandbar just across the water is the black area. So obviously a very racist setup, but it lends to a really, really amazing city, I tell you. Obviously a bit run down, uh, but great, really great. After a short stop at San Louis, looking around at what remains of Senegal's colonial days, Spencer pushes on towards Rosso, the border crossing. OK, I'm leaving uh, Senegal right now. I'm on the ferry. I'm heading across the river Senegal into Mauritania, and then from Mauritania on from there. Anyway, it's not hectic. There's only about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars on here. Loads of kids hassling, though. So you can see, on the other side is Mauritania. Although Mauritania is the 11th largest country in Africa, it only has a population of 3.5 million. 90% of the country is desert, so Spencer will be spending a lot of time on his own. OK, I'm in Mauritania, I've made it. I had to come across on the ferry, which cost, I had to pay for insurance. You have to pay to clear the bike, you have to pay for, pay for your carne de pasta. It's, it's, it's absolute 100% corruption. So you've got to have another $100 on you just to get through the border, even if you've got everything else. Um, right, I'm here, a little bit worried about it. Only 220 k's to uh, knock chot the capital. Shouldn't be so bad. Oh my God, I'm in the desert again. My God, it's stunning. It really is. I just wanted to stop to show you the colour of these sand dunes. Quite a place, eh? Yeah, Mauritania is a strange place because it's the only sub-Saharan uh, African country that's uh, Islamic. And also, it's the only country in West Africa that is run by uh, by nomads, because in other countries, nomads are often looked down upon, but here they're the majority, so they call the shots, really. So they've got Sharia law here, so I've sort of toned down a little bit. OK, I'm leaving uh, Nuadaba. Um, knock shot, sorry for Nuadaba right now. I uh, didn't get to film much, because... I arrived late last night and I'm leaving early, early morning because I've got 500 kilometres to get through. The city was built in the 60s to become the new capital, so it's one of the newest sort of capitals in the world, but it uh, doesn't have any character. Travelling through this vast emptiness, not knowing where his essential fuel and water sources will be, Spencer takes precautions by packing extra litres. Yeah, this is really, really heavy duty. There's nobody around. There's no electricity poles. There's absolutely nothing. It's proper full-on desert. So I'm running out of water. My clutch has snapped. This is incredible. My heart is racing. If the bike doesn't start, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a last view, and then I'm just going to really hit it, hit it, hit it, because I don't feel very safe. the most incredible days, not of just of this trip, but of my whole life, I promise you. It's, it's absolutely magical, this place, magical. It has been, I've been constantly, constantly sandblasted. Libya, Egypt, and those kind of places, they've got uh, villages along the way and such like, but here, yeah, it's just nothing.
Mauritanian border was hilarious. It was just a tent with three guys asleep in it. It changed my money and everything. Anyway, here I am in Western Sahara, so I got through okay. It looks pretty similar to uh, Mauritania. It's just a little, little less windy and a um, little more hilly. That's it, really. There is really only one road through the sparsely populated Western Sahara to Morocco. His route takes him through Dakla to reach the border at Alaoun. It's approximately 980 kilometers, and Spencer's hoping to do it in two days, if he doesn't fall asleep. Just taking a break because it's kind of like, it's like driving in the snow. You end up not being able to see properly, and uh, the, it's got a hell of a lot whiter here. But uh, I'm beginning to lose my concentration again and not able to see, so, it, hey. Very strange. Okay, um, drove 840 kilometers today, just in time because the sun is going to go down soon. Um, I came to the outskirts of a town, well, not really a town, it's still in the desert, but this guy let me stay in his warehouse. It's sort of a yard, uh, not very good because the ground is rock hard, so I just had to make do, so I've used the bike really. And I'll probably be heading to Agadir tomorrow. Could do this in the morning, but it's just on my mind at the moment. I've just been thinking about what have I achieved, you know? What has it done? Is it the most selfish thing in the world? I know I've brought this up before, but I mean, what this hasn't done my children or my girlfriend any good. Oh, it's just so difficult. I mean, I've left them for nine months. I've been on the road for nearly nine months now, and uh, I just hope something comes out of it. I absolutely love Africa, and I love motorbikes. So I've just got to go down that route. Uh, I'm just blithering on. <laughs> Okay, it's six o'clock in the morning and uh, I'm still in the desert and I'm still in the wind. Um, it's freezing, freezing cold. It must be, must be close to zero. Despite the cold desert morning, Spencer makes good progress. The temperature, like the kilometers on his clock, rapidly rises as he arrives at the Moroccan border. Got out of the desert, but I'm still in the shadow of the valley of death. Went into the pharmacy in the town just back there. He said, it, uh, we checked up, it's 50. 50 degrees bang on dead on his thermometer. And that's an outside thermometer in the sun. But anyway, so this is what the road looks like. So it looks like I'm heading off. Check out this lovely old blue Mercedes. They've all drive Mercedes, by the way. Just heading round from Agadir to Marrakesh, and I'm in the high Atlas Mountains, just nipping the west side of them, just getting into them, but it's still pretty spectacular. If you're planning a trip to Africa, but you don't want all the hassles of Africa, then Morocco is a good option. Um, there's a difference between touring and adventure motorcycling. Adventure motorcycling is where you dealing with hardcore stuff, with the elements, with uh, bureaucracy. I mean, in, the, in these kind of areas we're in now, where it's touring, you've got good tar roads, good communications, good road signs. It's only when you go into Mauritania and other places around there that it becomes uh, adventure riding. And how much adventure riding depends on you as well. OK, I'm in a town called Chechchain. I can't even say it properly. It's magical here. You might have noticed I've had a slight haircut. It was hilarious. I went and asked um, this hairdresser if he'd cut my hair. And he said, no problem. I just said, just a little bit off, and he completely cocked it up. So I had to go to somebody else to get it done. And it's basically disappeared now. Only a mother would love it, eh? No, I'm really enjoying it here. Morocco is just, I, I was expecting nothing at all. Anyway, this place is nestled in um, a valley and you have to get here along those beautiful mountain passes. Oh, it doesn't really show you the whole city, but 
give you some idea. As you can see, it's not that big. And you won't see it because of the sunlight, but there's the mountain behind. I'm outside a town called Kenitra, and uh, you can guess what it's famous for. I just thought I'd get in touch with my uh, bees, with my feminine side. Hello. Okay, I've uh, been travelling about 250 days, maybe a little bit longer, I've sort of lost track of that, but I've just come to quite a serious point. Now I'm leaving Morocco, which is in the background, so it's my... I'm actually off African soil right now. So, feeling quite depressed, but still got Spain and uh, France to get through, so the trip isn't finished. of July I'm in Tarifa in uh, the south of Spain, obviously where I got the ferry over. Just doing a bit of work on the bike before I head off. Oil's fine, uh, tightened up the chain a little bit. Best of all, I brought a little bit of Mauritania with me, I'll show you. Look at that, that's from my air filter. All I did was just tip it upside down and that came out. So I smuggled a bit of desert with me. Okay, uh, my diary cams are getting more and more depressing, I suppose. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having culture shock. I can't believe it. I can't face people. I'm, I'm going to find this a lot more difficult than I thought. I thought the trip was going to be the difficult bit, and when I'd done it, I'd be all happy and yay, first person to circumnavigate Africa, but it hasn't worked out like that. I'm getting more and more down the more north I go. Everything that you take as normal disappears. Uh, when you're traveling in these sort of places, but I love them. I love these places. Oh. Okay, I'm going to stop now until I've got my thoughts together. Okay, I've continued up the coast and uh, the culture shock continues. I got very tired. I'm on the border with Spain and France in, people will know it, the Costa Brava and it's full of Dutch people, full of English people, and the streets are jam, jam packed, and I really, really can't take it. I expected a big epiphany and life-changing experience, and it's exactly what has happened right near the end of the trip. I've realized what it's all about, and I can't face telling you right now. Tomorrow I shall give you my big philosophical speech, because I'm a different man. just left Spain and didn't really do any filming because I was on a motorway and you could be in any country in the world really. I'm just going to go down to the coast, it's about 20 kilometers to a place called Argel de Mer um, and Le Boulou. See, my French is good, eh? And uh, I'm gonna camp there tonight. Just gonna try and sum up exactly what this trip has done. I've been, the whole time I've been going along saying, oh, it's not life-changing, there's no great epiphany, there's no, no amazing thing that I've realized, but actually I have. It's really made me realize how important, what things are important to me, and focus on what's good in your life, not what's on bad, because bad attracts bad. And I think the biggest thing I've learned on this trip is to be more accepting of others. I used to be very, very critical of, of other people, and. For God's sake, I don't know why, because there's nothing special about me. I'm going to try my best to be good to people and to not be self-centered and conceited. And yeah, it's, it's, it's so important to realize that, that every single person is different, completely different. After Spencer's emotional breakthrough, he mans up once more, gets off the beach and finally heads for home. But France has an unexpected bite creating one last ordeal. I find it quite hilarious. I've been all the way around Africa and I go and get stung by a bee 
and uh, my foot's swollen up. I've got an allergy. I'm supposed to carry an EpiPen, and I have got an EpiPen. I think that's the right way up. And uh, I'm just going to jab it into my thigh. So I don't know if you want to see my face or you want to see my leg. I'll show you my leg and then my face. Right, apparently I just jab it in like that. So here goes. Ah! Oh, that hurts. All right, so it's all gone. All the liquids come out. God, that was quick. <laughs> I don't know if that worked, but I'm just, that's it. Okay, it's my final day and I'm in a place called Chartres in France. I've got 550 kilometers uh, to Calais. I'm going to be hitting the motorway, so I won't be filming. The next time I'll be on the boat. Uh, sorry, in Channel Tunnel and it'll all be over. I said I was going to be limping home. I was talking about uh, the bike and my equipment and everything. But I suppose it's fitting um, that I'm literally limping home. I couldn't get my boot on. So don't laugh. That's how I'm traveling. OK, this is my very last diary camera. Um, I'm in England now. I'm actually in Smarden in the south of England, and I'm only about 30 kilometers or so from my final destination. But I had to stay out here last night, and my girlfriend came up to see me, and we decided that we'd stick with the whole camping thing, as it was the very, very last night of the trip. Luckily, we met um, a farmer who allowed us to stay in here. So we were in, like, a polytunnel. So that's my very, very last diary cam on this trip. Day 268. See you, man. I'd just like to say thank you so much to my mum and dad. Non-stop work, absolutely non-stop work. And thanks to my girlfriend and my kids for waiting for me. And thanks to all of you guys for everything. Cheers. I was so excited when he was coming and there was so much suspense and everyone was just waiting. And then he came around the corner. It was an amazing entrance and all the bikes just came and it was just, it was a really emotional moment. The major, major worry for me was the fact that he would go too fast, go round the bend, come off his bike, hit a tree and get injured. It sounds like an awful thing to say, but I wasn't really that worried. Of course, I was panicking after the shooting, particularly in a couple of other instances. I know pretty well what I think he's capable of doing, and I thought, if anybody could, I think Spencer could have a shot at it. I don't want to steal your thunder, but um, how much have you to date managed to raise to save the children? Uh, 26,166. Brilliant, well done. I had every confidence in him from the beginning that he would do it. He is a very determined young guy. Uh, he's strong, he's fit, and he's always been that way. Uh, when he wants to do something and he fixes it on his mind and does the preparation, he nearly always succeeds.